As a warning, this story does contain the mention of self-deletion. When I was around six years old, my dad's best friend ended his life. We'll call him Joe for the sake of the story. Obviously, it was a very rough and emotional time for my dad. Joe was my dad's best man at his wedding, the one guy who was always there for him. After my dad got married, he and my mother left Joe and the town they were in to start a life outside of the town that they grew up in. After years of moving around California, my family eventually moved to Utah, where my father worked for a successful internet business. Joe stayed behind in Washington. Because my family were so far away from their old life with Joe, there wasn't a lot of foresight or warning that Joe had intended on self-deletion. Joe's sister apparently had been blaming Joe's wife for the whole incident. Joe and his wife drank a lot and probably as a result fought a lot. My father always said that they were a passionate couple. Yes, they would fight often, but he hardly knew two other individuals who were so completely in love. For this reason, he didn't believe it. A few days after Joe self-deleted, his widow called up my father sobbing about how she thought it was her fault. After about an hour of trying to console her, he told her, if there was a way for me to talk to Joe now, I guarantee you that he would tell you that he loved you and that it wasn't your fault what he did. Crying, she still didn't believe him, but she thanked him for the kind words and let my father go. My dad was obviously distraught after that long conversation. He had been down in his office for a while, and he decided to come up and check on his kids while making a pot of coffee to take his mind off things. We were all supposed to be napping, but he thought he would peek his head into our rooms just to make sure we were safe. Maybe to try to have a little smile or a brightness added to his day. Sure enough, when my dad got to my room, I was fast asleep on my bed and had been for quite some time. He went to my brother's room and he was also sleeping. Finally, he checks on my sister, who is sleeping as smugly as an angel. He decides to go back toward my room and the kitchen to continue making and pouring his coffee. As he walks by my room, he notices a whimper. He turns around and enters my room where he finds me weeping when two seconds ago, I was fast asleep. I was five years old, and he said that the way I was crying seemed odd to him for my age. Normally, a five-year-old cries kind of drastically and overdramatically. I wasn't. I was just sitting on the side of my bed, weeping. My dad enters my room and says, Maddie, what's up? Why are you crying? It's then that I stop crying for just a moment, look up at him with tears in my eyes, and say, Rick, it's not her fault. I love her. It's not her fault. With that, I stopped crying and rolled over back into my bed and fell swiftly back to sleep. I have no memory of this happening, and I never heard the conversation. In fact, it wasn't until years later that I was even fully aware of what was going on with my dad's best friend. So it's not like I just heard them talking and repeated it. Needless to say, my dad almost needed new pants after that one. As a child, like many others, I was accompanied by an array of imaginary friends. Among these figments of my young imagination, the one I remember distinctly was a little girl named Sophie. Sophie, approximately my age at the time, between four and six, was just an ordinary girl wearing a dress and socks. The peculiar thing about her was the noticeable crook in her neck. I grew up in an old house, possibly around 80 years old, with our next door neighbor who we affectionately referred to as Grandma, 
and who has lived there for 60 years. This fact bears significance to the story. Sophie was my closest friend during my early years, a phenomenon not uncommon among children. We spent a lot of time talking and playing in my room, but she never ventured downstairs, claiming fear. It was a usual occurrence for me to descend the staircase, turn back and reassure her. Hey, see, it's okay. You can come down. Regardless, she would stay put, a fact I found utterly perplexing. As I aged, my interactions with Sophie dwindled, and ultimately, she faded from my memory. That was until, after relocating, my mother and I paid a visit to Grandma and began reminiscing about my childhood spent in the old house. My mother mentioned my habit of addressing the staircase when I was young, which piqued Grandma's curiosity, prompting her to ask, who were you speaking to? I casually answered, oh, Sophie, and I started to describe her. Grandma fell into a silent contemplation. After a while, she said, you know, when I initially moved into this house, my neighbors were preparing to move out. Tragically, a month before their departure, their daughter slipped and fell down the staircase, succumbing to her injuries. She had broken her neck. You know, I do believe her name was Sophie. In 2013, following my amicable divorce from my wife, we both relocated to separate residences. We've remained good friends, largely due to our shared parenthood of our daughter. To ensure fair custody, I rented an appealing house located in the city's historic district. Constructed in 1935, it was well-preserved and offered a perfect home for our three-year-old daughter during her fortnightly stays with me. It was during these visits that I began to notice my daughter conversing with an unseen friend. On one occasion, I discovered her in a tiny closet, deep in conversation with a little girl that she referred to as Betty. Considering her age, I assumed this was a product of her vibrant imagination, particularly as I had no idea where she had heard the name Betty. As a single dad to a little girl, I struggled with some aspects of parenting, particularly tasks like hairstyling. While her mother had a knack for it, I was left floundering. One evening, I put her to bed following a bath and remember giving her a quick hairbrush, but that was the extent of my hairstyling capabilities. The following morning when my daughter was just rising, her mom came to pick her up. She discovered our daughter's hair had been transformed into flawless fringe braids. Initially, she praised me for managing such an intricate hairstyle, but I assured her that I had not, and could not, have done it. When we quizzed our daughter about her braids, she said, Betty did them during the night. Aren't they pretty? This incident prompted me to break my lease, and we moved out within the next month. Betty did not come with us. I care for my niece full time, so she's like a daughter to me. She's done some peculiar things over the years, but here are a few that stand out. Once when she was still a toddler, I was roused from sleep by the sensation of my hair being brushed. As I opened my eyes, she simply whispered, shh, and attempted to close my eyelids, much like one might do for the deceased. On another occasion, when she was feeling under the weather, we lay in bed watching a movie. Out of the blue, amid the film, she warned, Don't let your feet hang off the bed like that. The devil can grab you and pull you to hell. Given she's only five, I can only hope that she overheard that from another child at school. At least I hope so. And lastly, 
As I was preparing dinner one evening, she strolled nonchalantly through the kitchen and said, I'll get you and I'll make it look like a bloody accident. It terrified me at the moment, but I later discovered that she had lifted the line from Cat in the Hat. She's a great kid, but she has definitely given me some spooks a time or two. I was babysitting my nephew, who was around four to five years old at the time. From down the hall, I heard him use the bathroom, but noticed that he didn't flush. When I inquired about it, he said, the man in my bedroom gets angry when I make noises. This was particularly unsettling, considering my sister and her husband had purchased their home from a man whose father had passed away in that very house. At the time this happened, I had recently discovered I was pregnant, and the stress was mounting. The pregnancy was unexpected, and I was apprehensive about breaking the news to the father, who happened to be my best friend's brother. One day, as I sat with my best friend in her room, her three-year-old daughter wandered in. I held back from discussing my situation in the child's presence, fearing she might inadvertently relay the news to her uncle. Opting for silence, I lay down on the bed. The little girl approached and gently placed her hand on my belly. She offered a reassuring smile and said, everything is going to be okay, before softly rubbing my abdomen. My friend and I exchanged bewildered glances. We were certain that the child had not overheard our conversation. Her room is upstairs and she always needed supervision while climbing the steps signaling her approach. To this day, I don't know if it was a weird coincidence or if that little girl knew something. I haven't yet become a parent, but an incident involving my younger brother still unnerves me. When he was about three years old, a chilling episode took place. My mother, overseeing my two younger brothers' bath, shouted for me to fetch a towel, allowing her to maintain her watchful gaze on them. As I was about to hand over the towel, my typically incoherent speaking toddler brother abruptly sat upright. He tilted his head and, with an uncharacteristic clarity, declared, Look, mom, I can't die. Without hesitation, he crossed his arms over his chest and slid under the water. Both my mother and I were momentarily stunned, but she swiftly plucked him out of the tub. Though he had swallowed a lot of water and was sobbing, he emerged relatively unharmed. Several years later, as we replaced the trim in my brother's room, adjacent to that very bathroom, we discovered a penciled height chart concealed behind the closet trim that connected to my parents' bedroom. The chart documented the growth of a child named Alan until the age of five. The elderly woman who had sold us the house had frequently claimed that she and her husband were the original homeowners and that they never had children. Driven by curiosity, we decided to investigate the home's history. The local library's newspaper archives unearthed a 1950s article revealing that the old couple did, in fact, have a child. Tragically, he had drowned in the same bathtub after presumably standing, slipping, and then striking his head. His name was Alan. After unearthing this connection, I could no longer bring myself to enter that bathroom, and it still unnerves me to this day.
Three years ago, when I was 15 and living in my village, something happened that I rarely speak about. People often think I'm making it up, but I've thought about it a lot this week, and I want others to know. My village is nestled in a rural area protected by the government, considered a natural paradise for the past 30 years. As a result, exploration is challenging since cutting trees is forbidden, which leaves a vast forest. I spent my summer there and hiking was my favorite activity. Although I had never ventured into the woods alone, I usually stuck to populated roads, my grandma informed me that cleaning services had opened a path, long covered by trees and bushes, for an upcoming race. Normally, I would go to the nearest town about an hour's walk away by the road, but on my way back from visiting friends, I took this newly rehabilitated path alone, which turned out to be a mistake. The first part of the path was relatively easy, with obstacles and landslides, but nothing compared to what awaited. The second part was a rock-strewn hill that required me to climb like a dog on all fours. Upon reaching the top, I noticed some animal bones, but thought little of them, considering the area's known wolf and bear population. I hastened my pace, relieved to find a stretch of plain floor where the woods truly began, only to encounter a dead end. Some massive trees had fallen in a row across the path, blocking passage. Oddly, beside these trees stood a small, seemingly abandoned barn in a clear field, devoid of trees, bushes, or large plants. It shouldn't have looked like that if it was truly abandoned. I grew concerned about the coincidental location of the fallen trees, the suspicious barn beside the clear field, and the fact that the path had been closed for 30 years. Something seemed really off. Continuing on, I approached the last hill my grandma had described, which led to the village. Suddenly, a silence fell, allowing me to hear branches cracking behind me. At first, I thought it was a bird, but the sound grew closer, resembling footsteps. Trying to convince myself it was an animal, I quickened my pace, and so did the footsteps. Terrified, I began to run, and so did whatever was behind me. I then heard incredibly loud grunts, my heart pounding as I sprinted towards safety. I reached my village in a minute or so, bursting into the patio of a relative's house and closing the door behind me, catching my breath for 10 minutes or so before returning home. Even now, recalling the place, the lack of a signal, and those haunting grunts chills me to the bone. I can't shake the feeling that something was following me, that the barn and the trees were merely distractions to slow me down. Needless to say, I never ventured into the woods alone again. apologize if this doesn't make sense, but I am freaked out and I have no idea how to explain this. My coworker and I were driving back from dinner to the place we were staying at. We had driven this route a handful of times and were very familiar with the surrounding area. It was a seven minute drive from the restaurant to where we were staying. We left the restaurant and had a straight drive for about two miles no turns until we had to take a right turn into the parking area of the property that we were staying at. As we approached the hotel, the tall Courtyard by Marriott sign was visible, as was the building. We were a block away from the turn, and then we just suddenly weren't. We were all of a sudden driving on a highway, about to take the exit to the right. It was immediately apparent, and I said to my coworker, wait, something's wrong here. And he replied, yeah, what the heck just happened? We were just about to turn into the parking area. 
I told him to pull over and I looked up on maps where we were. The map showed that we were 20 minutes away in the opposite direction that we'd come from. It was physically impossible. The time on the clock was still the same as it had been when we were next to the hotel. I don't understand and neither does he and he doesn't want to tell anybody because it sounds so crazy. But somehow we were teleported 20 minutes away. It was the single most disorienting feeling I have ever experienced. But now, ever since, I feel like everybody in my life has just changed. Everyone feels so distant. I can't shake the feeling that something is still very off. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch style house with a three car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right, my brother's room followed that, and lastly my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway when suddenly the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors and my heart began to race. Then they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close, and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there, and it visited me only to get worse as time went on. 
that image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. I'm a female and I was hanging out in the car last night at about five in the morning with my best friend who's also female. I will refer to her as Heidi. We wanted to watch the sunrise, but we live in a pretty big city, so we were trying to find a flat, high place where we could see the sky. Basically, I was just driving east until I found an empty parking lot or something that would be suitable. I guess we got distracted with the conversation because I drove probably a lot farther than I should have. Suddenly, there weren't any buildings or lights around at all just darkness and a few trees. Up ahead by a stop sign, there was this squarish gray shape that was lighter than the surrounding area. We both leaned forward and squinted to see what it was. Heidi asked what it was and I said, it's where the road goes up or something like that. It was really dark, so I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure. I think she said something else after that but I don't really remember what it was because it was just a normal conversation. The road suddenly dipped and I drove up the slightest incline. I'm almost to the stop sign at the end and then it hits us at the same time. Something is wrong. This feeling slams into me. The air goes still, the car goes quiet and without even looking, I know my friend feels it too. I've never felt anything like it. Fear, I guess, but different somehow. My ears and the back of my neck were really hot, like that feeling just before you pass out. Almost like when you've stood too long with your knees locked, but I was wide awake and sitting. My heart was tight in my chest, like someone had their hand wrapped around it, and I felt sick to my stomach. Not like I was going to throw up, just really uneasy. It was like primal fear. I'm not really describing this well enough. It's kind of indescribable, but that's the gist of it. It was like my body knew something that my mind didn't, which is why the only word I really have for it is primal. This all hits me in the few seconds it takes me to get to the stop sign. When I pull up to it, I see that right in front of us is a roadblock with a big yellow sign on it. Dead end. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't even feel it. Neither of us were breathing. I'm not sure if I imagined it or not, but somehow the woods around us got even darker. Like, unnaturally dark. I got this feeling that just kept telling me I have to get us out of here right now turn around, my best friend says quietly. I don't look at her, but her voice is deadly serious. My head runs through the scenario impossibly fast. The road was too tight, so if I tried to turn around the way we'd come, I'd either hit a tree or I'd have to stop, reverse, stop, put it in drive over and over again. No thanks. I turned left instead speeding out of there, and as I drove farther away, the horrible feeling gradually lessened, until it was less cold-blooded fear and more deep-seated discomfort. Did you feel that? Heidi said when we finally got to a stoplight and saw a building. We started talking to each other, just basically saying, what was that? And Heidi actually said it first. But apparently in the moment, we had thought the exact same thing. I'm about to see something. I remember looking around in the dark when it happened, and I was just sure that I was going to see something. I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was just positive about it. Heidi said she looked away from the windows, but I was driving, and I didn't really get up the urge to look away for some reason. I don't know. I know nothing really happened, but this really spooked me. 
Heidi said something like, maybe it was an animal hiding in the woods, or maybe there was a dead body, or maybe it was just a person who had really bad intentions. I don't know, but no logical human explanation feels sinister enough. I pulled up a satellite view on my phone of where we were, and there's not really much going on in that immediate area. Past the dead end signed, the woods get thicker, and the road turns into gravel and eventually leads to this nonprofit organization, some kind of little church organization. There's a few little buildings built in a circle and what seems to be some mobile homes or RVs or something, and two to three houses, all in this little clearing in the middle of the woods. There's also a little river past that. Other than that, there's just not really anything around there. Still, I haven't stopped thinking about this since it happened. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant so I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were, and I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot, and it was just deserted. Nobody lived there, not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street, and people noticed that every house nearby was shut closed. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain. I was in the middle of nowhere, and I heard a knock on my car's mirror. 
I work as a security guard in various hospitals, and I keep on changing sites during my shift because that's what my job requires me to do. I was going to another site tonight at about 12.30 in the morning when I stopped my car at a signal. The roads were pretty empty, emptier than usual, maybe due to the long weekend here in Canada. It was all dark around and not even a single person or car. Then when I stopped at the signal, my car just turned off automatically. Then I heard some kind of knock, as though somebody was knocking on the back mirror of my car. I looked around from the inside, but I couldn't see anybody. I checked all the mirrors and the doors and they were all locked, and then I left. There was nobody and nothing around that could have made that noise. And I'm just wondering if anybody can explain this. I had moved into a new apartment with a roommate who was related to a friend of mine. This apartment was located on the opposite side of town, and I was not familiar with this area when I moved there. A lot of these apartments were literally newly built, but a lot of the lots around the area were still being developed, and it was a very desolate part of town. Most of the area, before construction began, was large amounts of old farm areas that were unkempt and no longer lived on. I am very sensitive to the paranormal, and during this time I was just beginning to understand why there was so much paranormal energy around me. My fear was literally a beacon, as my aunt explained to me. The very first event I experienced after moving into my new apartment happened within a week. At the time, I didn't have my own car, and besides getting rides from friends, I mostly had to take the bus to get to work. The bus stop that I had to walk to was pretty far away from the apartment complex. There was a lot of new construction everywhere on that road in front of the complex, but there was a gas station and a very small shopping plaza that was mostly empty, except for a bank and a small mom and pop grocery store. I used to sometimes stop at this grocery store and get some Starbucks iced coffee before walking to the bus stop. One very early morning, I want to say maybe around 5.30 a.m., I was walking to the bus stop. I had my earbuds in and I was just walking along, not really paying attention to my surroundings. Suddenly, I got a very cold chill up and down my spine and I got the distinct feeling that someone was walking behind me. I turned around, but nobody was there. I got a little nervous and left one of my earbuds out just to keep myself a little more alert. I continued walking and was almost to the shopping plaza when I heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around again and even though I continued hearing the footsteps and was totally frozen in fear, I didn't see anything. I couldn't move a muscle and then I heard something rustle in the bushes next to the sidewalk very close to me, and the footsteps stopped. I caught my breath, and for some reason the energy that I felt was not a positive one, so I decided to sprint to the little grocery store in the plaza. I calmed myself down long enough to walk over and buy what I needed. Then I realized I had at least another seven to eight minutes to walk to get to the bus stop, as I near the door to leave the store, in the parking lot, I see as clear as day a figure of a man that seemed like he was standing in his own fog. I honestly couldn't tell any of his features, but as soon as he seemed to realize that I saw him, he vanished before my eyes. I looked around to see if maybe anybody else had seen it, but it was 5.50 a.m. at this point and no one was in the store with me except for the person at the register. I gathered my courage and forced myself to walk to the bus stop. As I'm waiting for the bus to arrive, I again started to feel a shiver 
and my heartbeat quickened. I got up from the bench where I was waiting and began to look around, but I couldn't see anything. Then, I swear as I breathe, I heard directly in my ear the voice of a man say, I'm sorry. As I'm typing this story out, I literally have chills just remembering the sound of his voice. I instantly knew that it was the figure I had seen in the parking lot. I stood there so freaked out, almost in tears, and the bus finally came to get me. After this happened to me, I paid my friend to drive me to work for the next two months. A lot of other weird things have happened, but this tops the list. A few years back, my mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousin's, and their kid's house. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, Although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, she suddenly saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three young people. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all as the shops are regular meeting places for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd about these young people. My mom said that they were dressed in the period of the 1970s, when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but nobody was acknowledging them. Their existence was completely overlooked by other people, as if they were invisible. My mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious teenagers had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought maybe they had gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes later, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was how normal these teenagers looked, but the fact that she was the only one that seemed to be able to see them. It's a story she still tells today. My cat and I were on the bus, heading up to a takeaway so I could get food for us. The nice lady sells tuna to me for my cat. And I saw multiple figures get onto the bus out of the corner of my eye. My cat even meowed at them. But when I stood up, there was no one around other than the driver. I asked the driver if anybody else had gotten on. And he just kind of shook his head and gave me this worried look. I think he had seen what I had seen, but didn't want to address it. On my walk home that night from the chippy, I saw numerous shadows in the fog, which startled my cat so much that he actually jumped off my shoulder, and I later found him at home. Usually, my cat is really well behaved, so I have no idea, but that night and that night bus were freaky. middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, 
I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. But I've driven this part a million times and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work, and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. When I was a kid, I was sitting in the back seat of my parents' car, traveling through a built-up area, when my brother, who was sitting next to me, suddenly cried out in fear. My mom was in the front passenger seat and quickly turned around to ask what the matter was. My brother said, I've just seen a woman standing in a bus shelter and she didn't have a face. He then went on to explain that where her face should have been, there was just a gaping hole, but it was glowing white. The bus shelter had been on my side of the road, but I had been looking out the front, so I never saw anything. I 
asked my mom if we could go back and see if the woman was still there, but my brother was genuinely scared and begged us not to. At the time, my mom said that she thought it was just her car's headlights flashing in the woman's face, but the way my brother was so scared definitely made me question that explanation. I'm a bus driver for TransLink, Bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex, with most of its buildings run down and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night Always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight, and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So I just closed the door and gunned it. I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, what the, and I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure-sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open. I asked the couple what the problem was, but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents, accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus. A young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong, and she said that there was nobody back there, and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. 
there was no shadow, no sound, no body. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky.